Now, we're in the third week of a series uh, that we are calling Citizens, and we're taking a look at a letter that a man named Peter wrote. Uh, and it's called, it's found in our Bible, that's the book of First Peter. Now, Peter is writing to a group that is scattered, a group that has gone through hardship, a group that is being persecuted. And he writes all of these things describing how it is to live out lives as citizens of God's kingdom. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to kind of see how he starts off uh, after his introduction. What is his first thing that he's jumping into? And before he kind of gives all of this advice or before he gives all of this counsel, all of this encouragement, what he does is he spends time doing what's called the doxology. And doxology is just an expression of praise to God. And so what Peter does is he does this expression of praise to God. So if you have a Bible... You can turn to the book of 1 Peter. If you don't have a Bible, whether you're in our Sowerton campus or our Quakertown campus, we have them here for you. If you don't own one, take that one home. It's our gift to you. We believe that the Bible is filled with life-changing truth, so we want you to have access to that. So if you're using one of our Calvary Bibles, you can turn to page 828. And we're going to be reading from 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we actually cut off that doxology, that expression. It actually goes all the way to verse 12. We only read to verse 9. Actually, in the original language, it's actually one big long run-on sentence. But we're only going to do the first nine verses uh, today. And so what is going on? What is Peter doing? He's saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes out and he explains the different reasons as he goes on in that doxology of why God is worthy of praise. But what does he start with? Because what we're going to be talking about today is this concept of new birth. We read about in those verses that we were talking about, but we're going to be talking about this concept of new birth. And I think that where Peter starts this praise is so important to understanding the depth of this concept of new birth. What does he say? Praise be to God the Father... Because of his mercy, his great mercy. Peter is setting up some deep truths about this new birth. And in order to understand that depth, we need to understand this concept of the mercy of God. And so the first thing we need to understand about new birth is we need to understand where we are born out of. When it comes to this new birth, we need to understand where we are born out of. We are born out of the setting of being dead. Okay? If this is news to you, this is new, if you're kind of new to church and you're kind of trying to understand what's going on, let me explain what I mean by that. Okay? When I say we are born out of the setting of being dead, we need to go back to the beginning of the story. Go back to the first book. We're going to go back to Genesis. And what happens? God creates He creates everything. He creates the the birds. He creates the the animals. He creates the mountains. He creates the the trees. He creates everything, and it is good. And what does God do? He creates man in his own image. And God creates a garden, and he puts man in this garden. And then what does God do? He gives, he establishes one new thing. If you will turn to Genesis chapter 2. If you have the Bibles here, it's on page 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. 
So God has created, right? And then what does God do? He says, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is the establishment of the first law, the first command from God. And I want to pause here for a moment because I think that we need to pay attention to something because it's something that I hear at times. When I've talked to some people at times, and I've talked about just Jesus and the need for a new birth and the need for Jesus, what I hear at times is a statement that I want to just kind of address for, for a moment. What I hear at times is this statement. But I'm basically a good person. Right? I haven't done anything big. I haven't done anything really wrong. I'm, I basically have lived my life good. And what we're saying at that point is, well, I'm okay with God, right? Because I haven't really done any of the big sins. You know, I, I have done some stuff, but I'm basically good. I haven't done any of the big sins. Listen, what we need to understand is this. There is no such thing as big sins. Not in comparison to the holiness of God. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. And when we sin, what are we doing? We are removing God from the picture. We are, in fact, rejecting God. Here's why we need to talk about this. Because what happens after this is Adam is given a partner. He's given Eve. And they are living life in this garden. And then one day they are tempted, Eve is tempted by this serpent to eat the fruit of the tree that God told them not to. There's one law, one command. Don't eat from this tree. And they eat from the fruit. They eat the fruit from the tree. And in so doing, they remove God from the picture and they reject God. And the result is is an eternal, tormented separation from God. The result is death. But, I mean, they, they just need a fruit, right? I mean, it's like not that bad to eat an apple or an orange or a kumquat, which we don't really know what the fruit was, and I'm pretty confident it's not any of the fruits that we know today, Right? They haven't done anything wrong since then. They just ate a fruit. Shouldn't they just be okay with God? They didn't do anything really big. They ate a fruit. And eating that fruit brought on the consequence of death. Eating that fruit brought on the consequence of an eternal, tormented separation from God. There is no such thing as big sins. Sin is sin. And the result of that sin is death. And all of humanity enters into the story from that point on in the setting of sin, in the setting of death. And here's where mercy really matters. Scott McKnight is a scholar and theologian, and he defines mercy as this. He says, mercy is that pity God shows towards humans in spite of their sins because of their total helplessness to right their wrongs. We find ourselves in this setting where we are dead, where we are spiritually dead, where we are eternally separated from God, and we are helpless to do anything about it. And in spite of our sins, in spite of our rejection of God, in spite of us removing God from the picture, what does God do? He descends into our setting and offers us a way out. I was talking to someone uh, this week who was talking about uh, uh, counseling and therapy, and they were talking about, uh, he drew like a, a U, he drew this U on, on a whiteboard, and he was like, you know, oftentimes we... we end up finding people that we encounter, in the, and they're at the bottom of this pit. Whether it's an addiction, whether it's, it's, it's the despair, whether it's, they're at the bottom of this pit, and what we tend to want to do is to climb down into the pit, is what he's saying. But in therapy and counseling, they're saying, no, if you climb down into the pit, you're just both in the pit. 
And so in therapy and counseling, he's saying, what you need to do is throw a rope so they can climb out. Right? That's counseling. That's therapy. That's not God. That's not God. God descends into the pit because God is the rope. God is the ladder. God steps into our setting and offers himself as the solution. God is constantly the one who initiates the mercy. He is constantly the one pursuing us. What does God do in response to Adam and Eve eating the fruit? Well, he could have done a number of things, right? He could have done a number of things. Adam and Eve had just rejected him. They had just rebelled him against him. They had just sinned. And the consequence is death. What God could have done at that moment is just send lightning down and completely wipe them out. Right? For those of you who are, uh, are movie fans, he could have done like a, a, a little Marvel thing with Thanos. God could have just snapped his fingers and they all kind of fade away into dust. He could have done anything. And he had the right to. What does God do? He goes to them. He goes to them. The Bible says that he showed up walking in the cool of the day. God steps into their setting. Then he does something really interesting. He asks a question. He says, because when when, when, when Adam and Eve heard God walking in the setting, they, they hide from him because they were filled with shame for what they did. They were filled with shame. And so they hide. And what does God do? He steps into their setting and he says, where are you? Where are you? One of the characteristics of God is that he's omniscient. He knows everything. Were they just such good hiders? Were they such good at hide and seek that God just was like, all right, I give up. Where are you? Did did he just forget for a moment or no, God was omniscient. He's always been, he always knows. He's always known. He knows everything. He knew where they were. He knew what they had done. So why does he say, where are you? Even in that question, God is extending mercy. Even in that, he allows them to confront their status and confess it to him. What did they say? We hid because we were naked and ashamed. God said, who told you? Who told you? God knew what was going on. And God walks him through. Walks him through them identifying where they are at, identifying their situation, allowing them to confess it before him. And then what does he do? He gives them a promise. He gives them a promise. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God is cursing the, the serpent, he's cursing the serpent. And then in 15 he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God promises that there will be one day an offspring from the woman who will crush the head of, ev- of this evil. Who will defeat evil. It is a promise that God is going to make a way to redeem humanity. And this promise is fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus reveals what has to happen in regards to our status of being dead. In regards to our hopeless status of being dead, Jesus reveals what has to happen in John chapter 3. Page 725 in the church Bibles, if you're using that. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus is having a conversation with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, he says this, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can sing the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Nicodemus replies, he goes, How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. 
What Jesus is saying is that we enter into the story spiritually dead because of sin. And the answer to that, the answer to the consequence of death from sin is new birth. It's to be born again. And the only way that can occur is through Jesus. This is what causes Peter to exalt God in the doxology in 1 Peter. It is the fullness of God's mercy mercy that is expressed in Jesus. Well, we need to understand, again, that this is something that humanity cannot do on its own. It is something that humanity can't even do with help. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. When we talk about new birth uh, in, in, in church, there's also a word that is used uh, in, in, in conjunction with it. It's called regeneration. And regeneration is the work that God does to bring new life to dead sinners. And this is God's work and God's work alone. It's not our faith that saves us. It's the one in whom we place our faith that saves us, Jesus. It is God who initiates. It is God who does the work of regeneration. It is not something we manufacture by somehow having great faith or somehow our faith made it happen. No, our faith is in Jesus. It is Jesus who saves us. Our faith doesn't manufacture or catalyze new birth. Our faith responds to the work that God has already done. And so in order to understand the wonder of new birth, we must first understand that we are born out of the setting of death. And the second thing we need to understand is what we are born into. What we are born into. We are born out of the setting of death and we were born into something as well. We are born into a living hope and an inher- into an inheritance. Let's look at ver- verses 3 and 4 again from 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We are born into a living hope. Do you understand what that means? It is not a hope in our finances. It is not a hope in our job status. It is not even a hope in a political candidate. It is a hope in Jesus. It is a hope that is living because of the resurrection. And how is that connected to new birth? Well, what, what did this new birth come from again? We were dead, and our new birth now brings us life. When we were dead, our hope is dead. But through Jesus, we are now alive. And our hope, our hope, new birth, brings us from the setting of death to the setting of new life, a regeneration, new birth, which results in a living hope in Jesus. And why is this important? Why is it important that our hope is based in the living hope of Jesus? Because hope, living hope, is not wishful thinking. It's not wishful thinking. The Greek term for hope in the passage means an eager, confident expression. An eager, confident expression. Expectation, sorry. This is where living hope Jesus' resurrection and new birth collide into our understanding. Our living hope originates from a living, resurrected Savior. Peter's living hope is Jesus Christ. You see, usually when we think about hope, it centers around something that we wish for. Usually when we think about hope, it centers around something that might happen. Living hope centers around something that did happen. Jesus was born in a manger. He did live a perfect life, fully man and fully God. He did die on a cross. And then, and then, what brings about this living hope? That stone was rolled away. And Jesus walks out of that tomb eternally victorious. What we need to know here is that Peter cannot and will not separate hope from salvation. 
He will not separate hope from the work of Jesus in bringing us salvation. Peter cannot separate new birth from the resurrection. For the resurrection is the evidence of regeneration. Basically, what we celebrate on Easter of what God did in bringing Jesus alive out of that tomb is what God does in us spiritually in bringing us from death to life. And this is the basis of hope for Peter. And the hope that we have is secure. In fact, it is kept secure by God as an inheritance. It is the result of our new identity and new citizenship that has been given to us through Jesus. It cannot be ruined. It cannot be damaged. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be destroyed, taken, or lessened. It is a secure inheritance. Again, what does it say in the verses? It is being guarded by God's power through faith. But the power of that faith is not our own power. It is God's power, and this is huge because it means that our salvation is not sustained by the fickle nature of our faith based on our own strength, but instead it is secured and sustained through God's power. Now, why is it called inheritance? Why is it called inheritance? Well, at the beginning of this doxology, we were praising God the Father. It is the Father who, who brings about this new birth through us, through his son Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus, we were dead as sinners and now we are given life through a new birth. And since the Father has caused this new birth through Jesus, we are now born into his family. And we can look forward to a special inheritance because we are God's children. Now our hope isn't caused or secured by our behavior. Our hope, new birth, is only possible because of God's work. However, that doesn't mean that hope is completely separate from our behavior. Instead, this living hope becomes the basis of all we do as Christians. It is the motivating spark behind all Christian behavior. Because when it comes to new birth, we need to first remember that we are born from a setting of death. We then need to remember that we are born into a living hope and into an inheritance which leads us to the last thing we need to learn. When it comes to new birth, we also need to examine what we are born to do with this new life. What are we born to? Let's go back to the Bible. And look at verses 7 and 9. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is the result of this new birth? Praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We are given new life in order that we may give praise, glory, and honor to God. We are born to worship. We are born to worship. Now, I want to make sure that we understand worship for a second because a lot of times when we talk about worship, we think about what Andy was doing on stage earlier or, or uh, what Dan was doing over in Quakertown on stage earlier, uh, just singing songs. And that's an expression of worship. We express our worship through singing of songs, yes. But how we define worship at Calvary Church is this. Seeing God accurately for who he is and responding appropriately. Worship is when you see God, you see him for who he is, and you respond with an appropriate heart. You respond appropriately. So we worship with our very lives. We worship with our very beings. Everything we do is an act of worship, or should be. Or should be. This brings us full circle to the theme of our series. You see, when we experience new birth, we are given a new identity, a new citizenship. Are we living lives of worship as citizens of God's kingdom? 
Do we see God for who he is and respond appropriately in all areas of our lives? When I go to work and someone annoys me who sits outside of my office and probably sits right there. (laughs) That wasn't very worshipful what I did. (laughs) Do I respond in a way that is expressing worship to God? When I go to work and, and my plate is just overloaded and I think something happened that is unfair or I'm just kind of upset at what's going on. Do I respond with a heart of worship and, and, and conduct my work in, an, in a way that it is worship towards God? When I'm at home and I walk through the door and I'm greeted by teenagers, I want to walk back out. <laughs> but I step forward. And when they're complaining and they're saying different things that annoy me, do I respond with a heart of worship? When I open the mail and there's a new bill there that I wasn't expecting, or or when I look around and there's something else that's broken that I need to have fixed, do I respond with a heart of worship? What is my heart's response? In just a short amount of time, when I go to the polls and I cast my vote, and I think about those who disagree with me, is my heart one of worship? The next day when either who I voted for won or didn't win, is my response one of worship? When I examine my responses in everything I do in life, can I say they are responses of worship? In the Old Testament, worship was done through sacrifices, grain offerings, or or animals that were offered. And and what was was asked was that you brought your your first fruit, you you brought your best, you you, you brought the unblemished lamb, you you spent time looking through your flock and and identifying which lamb was was the best one, and and, and are there any blemishes on examining and making sure that this was the best to bring before God. In the New Testament, what we learn is now we are living sacrifices. At the end of the day, if I were to step back and think through my interactions with everyone that I interacted with in this day, at the end of the day, if I were to think through my thoughts and my responses, and would I have brought an unblemished lamb? Would would I have lived a life of worship? You know, maybe, maybe what we need to do this week is actually do an assessment at the end of the day. You know, when when, when you think about the Old Testament, that you think about that that person going into their flocks and they're they're examining the sheep and they're paying attention, they're they're looking, is there any blemishes on this lamb? They're checking the feet. it's it's, it's, It's an investigative process. Maybe this week what we need to do, at the end of the day each day, Let's just do a little bit of investigating. What kind of worship did I have today? Did I bring my first fruits? Did did I bring my best? If you're like me, more days than I'd like, the answer will be no. And this is where God's mercy comes in again. This is where God's mercy shows up again. And we bring this realization to him. And he extends his mercy. And we turn towards him. And we respond with gratitude and worship. And go on the next day trying to worship 
and respond appropriately to him. Knowing that our salvation is secure, not in due part to our efforts or our perfect worship, but it is secure because of the inheritance that's secured through God's power. This week, why don't you do that? Take an assessment. Each night, how did I do? How can I change it? What do I need to bring to God and ask for forgiveness? Just spend some time talking to him. He loves when you talk to him. And before we end, I just want to talk to another group of you just in case. You see, this doxology, this, this praise of God, centered on God's mercy, centered on this new birth. When we think about it, we need to understand where we started. We started in the setting of death because of our sin. And through Jesus, through Jesus' resurrection, we are offered new birth. There's nothing we can do. We are hopeless. There's nothing we can do in our hopeless situation. There's only God who can bring us from death to life. But for some of you, maybe you haven't accepted that gift of new birth. The answer to being spiritually dead, the answer to the consequence of sin is to be born again, and that can only happen through Jesus. And if God is stirring in your heart, you're like, I, that's what I want. That's what I want. Well, then my question for you is, what do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man? Do you believe that he was born, that he lived a perfect life, that he died uh, uh, on the cross, a penalty that was meant for us, but he took it on? Do you believe that he was put in a tomb and on the third day that tomb rolled out, uh, rolled away and he walked out alive, eternally victorious? Do you believe this about Jesus? Do you believe that? And have you accepted Jesus as Lord? And if you're like, that's what I want. That's what I want to do. Well, then as I pray to close, I ask that you just offer a prayer as well. Say, Jesus, that is what I believe about you. And only you can take away my sins. So I choose you as Lord. If that's something that you want, you can pray that as I pray to wrap up our our Sunday. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for what you have done us in bringing us from death to life. And Lord, if you are stirring in the hearts of anyone today, I ask you that they would choose Jesus as Lord. That they would choose to follow Jesus. Lord, for those of us in this room who have chosen Jesus as Lord, I ask you that you would allow us to live out lives as citizens in your kingdom, to live out lives of worship and praise to you. Then whatever we do, at home, at work, while we're driving, in the grocery store, wherever we're at, in school, that our lives will be an act of worship to you, that we would be living sacrifices for you. Reveal in our hearts what we need to do to continue to worship you in a way that honors you. And give us the strength through your power, through your Holy Spirit to do that. Bless this church, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.